Welcome to the show, my love. We've got Brooklyn Decker here. How are you doing over there with that beautiful, beautiful backdrop? It's gorgeous where you are. Hi. We, yes, we are in the mountains of North Carolina, which feels so decadent and nice because we feel so sort of secluded um, in the best way. But, um, you know, I am doing well as, you know, we're in the middle of this quarantine and um, there are good days and there are bad days and strange days and today's a good day. Good. How about you? How are you doing? You're, you're having an opposite experience in that you're in the middle of a city. Yes. Um, we're good. I do feel like I've been like extra quarantined. You know, I'm not one of the people who's kind of bravely exploring more. I've been, we've been very much at home. Rory, like, you know, we'll go on walks and Rory goes on a walk with Jax every morning to kind of give me some time. And Great. so we're doing, yeah, we're doing, I would say we're doing well. And there's all like the normal things and feelings that come with being in the middle of a pandemic and being quarantined. But we feel grateful. Like, I really do come back to gratitude every day, being like, oh my gosh, like when I start getting stressed, I'm like, okay, like I have so much to be grateful for, right? Like all these things that a lot of people other like don't have. And to even just have the bare essentials and to have the luxury of getting to be at home and to yes. be safe is the biggest, you know? Because yeah. a lot of people don't have that. So we do come totally back to that agree. gratitude a lot. I think that's smart. And I think it's wise to check into that because I do think I am like, I'm of two minds because I think it's necessary to have that sense of perspective because otherwise I think you can drown in your own anxiety and fears. But I also think, and I don't know if you feel this way. I also feel like, you know, I've talked to so many friends who are either, you know, on the, one of my friends is on the front line. She's pregnant. There are so many fears that sort of surround oh that gosh. thing. Right. But then but then there are friends who she has her own guilt around all of that. And she's like, I'm not seeing enough cases. So I don't feel everyone's giving me a round of applause and I don't feel deserving. And then I have other friends who are home and who have tough days and feel guilty because they have tough days. And I'm kind of like, you're allowed to be totally comfortable. You're allowed to be able to be privileged enough to stay home and still have really tough days. Yeah. You're allowed, like whatever that thing is, you're allowed to sink into it. But I do, I think it's interesting. Like, everyone now is grappling with, I think, some semblance of guilt, some anxiety, some longing, you know, for either it's to be home with your children to be safe or longing to be back at work or longing to go into, you know, a safe world again. It's just a very, it's a really strange time. Totally, totally. And I think that's important. Like, I always do feel like I have to preface, like if I have feelings about things, I feel like I have to preface it with, I know I don't have it the worst. And <laughs> like, I right. know, you know, but I, but there, there are really real things. Like we were just talking about kind of being a new mom and like the anxiety and feelings that come with that. And like feeling like, okay, I have to, like, I have to stay healthy because I'm the food supply. I'm breast exclusively yes. breastfeeding this child. So at the beginning I was like, like the first couple of weeks I kept being like, oh, I don't feel good. I'd have like, yeah. like phantom symptoms. I'd be like, oh my gosh, like, am I sick? What happens if one of us got sick? And then like, who watches Jax? And like all these things. And yeah. And I Those think are since, legitimate fears, yes, by the and, way, and things you have to work through for sure yes, and have solutions and, to. Exactly. And since we've kind of progressed into it a little bit, I kept realizing like I was having this anxiety and I was like, okay, I need to take care of myself. I need to figure out like how I can manage this a little bit better. And one of my solutions, which I've talked about before um, on the show and on social media was, is I really needed to like create space from the news. Like I, I was reading too many articles. I was knowing too much. And then I was, you know, really manifesting yep. that within myself. So anyway, I mean, it's a crazy time and, um, you're, you're a parent of young children as well. You have a yeah. what, two and four, two and four. Yes. And, and yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Like I think each as a parent going through this, I think I keep thinking like, do my friends who have kids who are in middle school have it harder because they're having to both maintain their jobs from home. They're lucky enough to be working from home, but also making sure that their kids get on, you know, their four and five Zoom calls a day to keep up with school. And then I have friends who, one of our um, dear friends, a couple of their daughter is graduating high school this year and she doesn't get to finish her senior year. And I keep thinking about how challenging that is. And then I think about you and I think about just, we were talking about this offline, but just hormonally how, um, 
this time is so raw. We were saying earlier, like it's, it's, it's you're like, you're, you're walking around the world, like a raw open nerve, just that's how you mm-hmm. feel in the best of times. And yes. And you fear, I know when I first had my kids, I remember just sobbing on the way home from the hospital because I was scared about getting into a car wreck. Like I I was, it was, I guess it was rational fear, but it was totally hormone induced, irrational fear at that time. And then to, so like you go through all of that, but then to actually be dealing with a credible threat that is a pandemic, I can't imagine what that must feel like. And so my point is, it's a very long winded way to say that um, it's a weird time to have kids. It's in a way it's wonderful because it forces you to really like get yourself together. You know, it forces Mm -hmm. you to kind of like put on a brave face and figure it out, which is a kind of a gift. Um, But I I think everyone's feeling this in their own unique way. And I think every situation is not without its challenges for sure. Yeah. And I think that um, when we were talking about this earlier and I got emotional because I'm like, it's so nice to let down, like as a parent, you have to be, or I feel like sometimes you want to be strong. And I don't know if it's, nobody's telling me to be strong. It's more just like I innately, I'm like, okay, like I'm the parent here and like, we have to figure this out. But like speaking to another mom, I haven't had another mom on the podcast since I've had Jack. And so it's really nice to have a space for myself to be able to like have those feelings and to be able to share them with someone else because otherwise it's easy to bury it down. Absolutely. And, and I think you're right. I think there is that need to put on a brave face for your kids and to sort of you know, live up to that responsibility that you have, which is right, right? Like that's what we have to do and should be doing as parents. But I think so often it can feel, it's an iso- it can be an isolating experience to be a new mm-hmm. parent for so many reasons, but then to actually be isolated, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new challenge and everything you're going through, I have felt and other moms have felt, all of them in, in some way or another, but I haven't had to go through it in the way that you have during this time. So your feelings are valid. And I also think like, yeah, you got to wake up and get it together. You have that baby to take care of. And it's, and that's mm-hmm. hard, but I, I think, I think that's a good responsibility to have right now. Yes. So let's switch gears for a little. I do want to get back to parenting a little bit later yeah. because I feel like you have a wealth, wealth of knowledge for me, but let's Dear. start with how we first met because Andy Roddick is your husband and he is responsible for me meeting my husband which is pretty exciting that's like a pretty exciting thing to be able to share with people it's the best best like meeting story that I could imagine I was producing a bunch of stuff for with Andy Uh, we both worked at Fox Sports and we were at the U.S. Open and he was um, interviewing Serena Williams and I was producing it and he saw Rory in the locker room and I guess said like come meet my producer Rory and I met and literally that next day I said I met my future husband like I I like felt like I knew the minute I met him but it was crazy so such I remember you texting that by the way I remember that text message I'm sure Andy still has it in his phone somewhere that first day you guys met and both of you were like oh we're we're done this is it it's crazy I've met my person I never he ever would have thought you. that would be the case. <laughs> it's such a strange story. It's so funny. Like I, I told him we were talking today and he said, he goes, Sarah's my favorite person that I don't know that well. Meaning <laughs> like he, you guys work together. You're sort of like thrust into this situation where I, I'm guessing you were assigned to him or he was assigned to you, however that yeah. works. Right. Yeah. And, and, and he met you and he's like, I don't know this person really well, but she's so cool and so good. Like he could tell you were a good person and Rory so similar. And we had known Rory for years and loved him. And for whatever reason, like before going to New York, Andy's like, I'm putting them, I think he might have even talked to you about it. Like I'm going to introduce these two because I think there could be something there. Oh, I didn't know he knew ahead of time. Yeah. He was like, this was, I think the week you guys were going, he said, I need that, that introduction needs to happen. And I don't know. Yeah. It just, it makes (gasps) you two make so much sense together. And I don't know if it was like his instinct or just you guys gave him a similar feeling or what that was, but um, he adores both of you so much. And we adore both of you guys. And eight months or something or so after we met, maybe seven months, um, Rory proposed and you guys were also involved in this story. Yes. So Rory reached out and he was like, so I'm gonna propose on the beach. 
and I need you guys to be a part of it and like make sure the it was like I don't remember if we, did the we protect ring the was ring? In, yeah, yes. so you like you were filming on the we were filming the, for sure. Uh, you were yes. like you had like a big like cover over your head and you were filming on the lifeguard stand. Yes, Andy was watching the ring somewhere on yes. the beach. Yes, he was sitting with the ring. And we and had then, like a football catch. That's exactly what it was. And and Rory was throwing the football to you and missed. And you it was supposed to land right by the ring and you were going to find the yeah. ring. So that's right. It was like this big elaborate plan and there was no rehearsal. We didn't even get there. Like we got there early, but we didn't get there before to coordinate. We just sort yeah. of like found our point and it was so... It was so improvised, but also like there was a rough sort of outline to it. It was so sweet. And you, it, was, it, was it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And you have it terribly filmed, thanks to me. So It's amazing. I'll need I'm to share that video that. again. You did an excellent oh, job. Oh Perfect gosh. composition. Really like uh, there could be a future for you in this field. He should have like brought in a real, given that you're a producer, there should have been like a real camera person there. No, but you know, absolutely, you know. Absolutely not. It was perfect. Okay, so um, so an awesome little backstory with you guys, but I want to kind of start a little bit earlier in your life. You started modeling when you were really young, right? I did. I started when I was 14. At that point, I was local in Charlotte, North Carolina. Several people led me down that path, oddly enough. Like, I remember a substitute teacher. Her daughter was a model, and she would always tell me, she was awesome. She's like, you need to get into this. You need to do this. And and if a, a person in a mall, it just was weird. And so a lot of people were sort of, I don't want to say pushing me by any means, but like sort of encouraging and bringing up this path. And my mom said to me, is that something you're interested in? And I kind of thought as a 14 year old does like, sure, why not? That sounds like fun. You know, I get to wear prom dresses for photo shoot, whatever. Great. So I was young, but it, I was, I was protected. And, and then I went to New York at 16 and until I was 18, my parents never let me go to a photo shoot by myself. I wasn't allowed right. to travel alone. So I definitely felt really safe Good. in a sort of unsafe world, if that makes Good. sense. Good. And then your your career kind of skyrocketed. You end up on the cover of Sports Illustrated, which yeah. is like a huge accomplishment as a model, right? Yes. And then, so so tell me, so was that like this thing you were working towards? Did that just happen overnight? What was? How did that come to be? But uh, both. I mean, it's 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 so much of this chance. So it's not. It's it's funny. Like with modeling, the thing that's so hard about it is that it's not one of those professions where like if you work hard enough or if you're talented enough, you will be successful. So much right. of it is just like timing and luck, and like what's trendy in fashion at that time and like, do you fit that mold? It's so much of it is just simply luck. And so um, when I was actually modeling my sort of type, which was like sort of more athletic and more curvy and all American was not really in vogue. And, um, and fortunately Sports Illustrated was like one of the few clients who, who really um, was, was attracted to me, was drawn to me. And so I met with them and I got booked by them my first my first sort of audition or casting with them, I was 18. And then I think I shot it um, four years and on either the fourth or fifth year, I got the cover. So I had, I had like done my time with them. We'd worked together mm -hmm. for several years. They felt like a family. Um, but it was funny, like as far as fashion's concerned, like I had still, I, I've still never walked a runway. I never booked a runway show. Like in so many ways, I didn't have a lot of success in the industry, mm -hmm. but sort of the things that people see like the sports illustrated sports illustrated of the world um those were the things that i was attached to if that makes sense yes totally and then you you chose to switch to acting what tell how did that all, all come about yeah so i um when i moved to new york i was 18 and i grew up in matthews north carolina and all of my friends had gone to college like it was a very sort of traditional no one really goes into a creative industry like it's a sort of linear path right and so for me, I, I, I thought you could make a career out of modeling, of course, but I sort of thought like it was a means to an end. I thought like, okay, I'll go and do this for a few years. I'll make enough money to pay for school and then I'll go back to school. And so when I moved to New York, I was really missing that school experience and all my friends. And I, you know, I was by myself in New York in a model apartment, the whole thing, like I was living that world. Um, and so my, man, my now manager said to me, why don't you and this was 2005. So there were online classes, but you couldn't be a full-time student online. And so he's like, why don't you study acting? Like get an acting coach, read some plays. It'll at least give you something to work on. You know, you can work on your on-camera stuff. And so that's exactly what I started to do. I started studying with an acting coach um, and I loved it. 
And I had been auditioning for years, just thinking like, I'd really love this. Let's see if anything comes of it. And then I got my first big movie the same week, actually, I found that I got the cover of SI. That was a very good week. Yeah. And, um, and when I got three movies in a row, I told my modeling agency that I was done modeling. And so I went to do acting full time. And it's funny, like at that time, and it wasn't even that long ago, but this was sort of 2010, 11 ish, like at that time, you couldn't really do both, you know, like you weren't seen as credible in sort of the film and television world if you were modeling. So I kind of thought I had to give up both. And what's so cool now is that so many people are crossing over into everything. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's like whoever's talented will succeed. And I think the industry is so much more interesting now because you have all these sort of multi-players, if that makes sense. Totally. I, something I really love about you is I feel like on social media, you really portray such a, it's like this humble, down to earth, like authentic, you, you're like the opposite of the people who are posting like these like photoshopped, super shiny photos. You're like makeup free, like unflattering photos, <laughs> like, you know, just anything. It's just, I'm just so humble, Sarah. It's like, it's so hard to be this down to earth. <laughs> Stop. <It's> just just, <laughs> just accept, <laughs> accept my compliment. Take it in. So, <laughs> Thank you. so I'm not in this industry, so I don't know, but like, is there that pressure in, in your industry, in your world? I mean, I know there is, but has there been for you in that like you're supposed to conform and you've just said, hey, no, this is what I want. This is who I want to be. And this is like the authentic side of myself. It's important to me to share that. Or is it just maybe it's not an issue that I'm. No, that's a good question. It's so it, it's funny I, when I, I say this like it was decades ago when it was really like five years ago. But when I started on social media, it was actually 10 years ago. When I started on social media, it was at a time when you, when you were modeling, you didn't even have the name of the model on the page. I mean, Sports Illustrated did that. Like they were actually one of the first publications to sort of put like a story with a, a face, you know, and like write profiles about their women in the, in the magazine. And, and they were actually really advanced in that way, but you were just a picture. And so for me, social media 10 years ago, it was so exciting because I could actually just say whatever I wanted to say. And I could be the opposite of what I think people sort of saw on a page. Yeah. And so I had it as like this, I don't know, the, a, 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 a true version of myself. And so that's always been my relationship with it. And I think now it's so different because now, I mean, there are full conferences about like cultivating a brand and like, what's your yeah. image and what's on brand and off brand. And I think because my reason behind even getting on social media was to a total departure from like brand and image and all of that, because that's yeah. already kind of what was out there. I've never had that relationship with it. Now, that being said, like, my reps have said to me, you know, put like a cute picture on there once in a while. Like, would a TBT hurt you? And I mean, I think there's a point to that. Like, I do think, you know, I think that we are, I am in an industry of optics and I do think that it's probably the responsible thing to like, you know, show that side every once in a while. And like what woman doesn't want to feel sexy and gorgeous mm -hmm. every once in a while. So I think it's important to do that. But I guess because that was never my sort of intention going into it. It was never, the, for me, social media wasn't about building a following or a brand. It was about being, saying whatever the hell I wanted to say and not having to be the sort of like hyper stylized, hyper glossy version of myself that was already out there. Well, it's really refreshing. And I think a lot of people appreciate that about your online presence. Thank you. Yeah. I also just think it's fun, you know, like life is gross and funny and every day sort of disgusting things happen. And when you put that out there in a way that is sort of not talked about often, or like if you put those things out there, the responses you get are hysterical. It's just funny. It's just, it's more entertaining. It's more exciting to, to do that. I think. I love it. I love it. Have you always been like, have you always felt really comfortable in your own skin since you were young? Has that been a journey? Um, yes and no. I mean, I, yes, I think I've always felt comfortable. I don't think I've always been super confident, but I've always been like, well, whatever, this is who I am. But I think, um, I definitely had moments when I was modeling where I didn't feel like I, and I wasn't, I wasn't what was in style at that time. And I wasn't the right size. It wasn't the right body type, that right height, all of that. And so there were definitely moments where I was trying to conform to what that was, but 
even so I kind of like during those times, I kind of also was like, oh, I got to do this for my job. It, it wasn't, fortunately, I don't feel like I ever lost myself. That's huge. Um, okay. So then now you're on Grace and Frankie, which I love that show. Thank you. I love it. It's hilarious. It's so fun. So relatable. Um, and it's the longest running show on Netflix. Yeah. You're, you're in the midst of filming our seventh season. Yes. That's yes. Pretty exciting. I know. It's it's funny when we started the show. The only shows were um, House of Cards and Orange Is the New Black. So Netflix was really exciting, but we were their first original comedy. We were their first half hour. So we were kind of like, let's see how this thing goes. Um, they obviously like the demographic of our show or not the demo of our show, but like the, the cast of our show is they're now in their seventies and eighties. And I think Netflix was like, will this work on streaming? Sure. And what they found was that it was incredibly successful. Um, it worked across all age demographics. It, it's sort of been like the great uniter, which is really um, surprising and exciting. Really exciting. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, how many years had you been acting when you booked that? job like did you still feel like you were kind of a beginner or were you yeah like, going into that yeah I mean I still feel that way to be clear I still <laughs> I still feel that way um I had been acting full-time for five years when I got that show I mean I had been studying for longer but like as far as when I actually left sort of the modeling world and went full-time into acting it was five years when I got that um and I still feel like a newbie. I still feel like there's so much to learn. I still learn things every season. Um, I think it's, you know, I think one challenge that I had was that my sort of learning curve and that journey for me was very public and that I was sort of a brand new actor making those mistakes on the big screen. Whereas I think a lot of people who enter this business go to school for it. They've been doing it since they were a kid. They go to college for it. And so they're sort of like, a decade or a decade and a half of experience before they ever get on screen and they get to make those mistakes off screen and off stage, yeah. which like in a weird, it was, I think it's harder, but I think it's a, a gift to not have to sort of stumble. And I've made a lot of stumbles professionally on screen because I was new, but yes, I still feel like a newbie. Is that right? I mean, I feel like you've done an amazing job on that show. Well, thank you. Thank you. But, but I'm no acting like curve. expert. But so, well, so, you. and you get two of the, you get Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda are like incredible people to learn from, right? They're incredible. They're, I mean, they're, they're wonderful women and they're a joy to work with and they're a joy to know and be around, but also just technically and with their sort of experience on a set what they, I mean, it's, it's, it's second nature to them. It's like their relationship with the camera, their relationship with the light. I mean, it's like all of those sort of technicalities you, they take time to learn and they're, it, it's, it's really, it's really cool watching them work because it's like a very well-oiled perfected machine. Um, okay. And it's like, it's like, it, it, there's no better education than that. I can't even imagine. What has been, what do you think has been like the greatest thing you've learned being on this, sh that show as an actor? Like, how has your craft changed since the beginning? Oh, um, I think technically I'm more sound. I think before I was thinking about performance all the time and not so much of it, that's so much of it. But what I feel like no acting class or acting coach teaches you is actually what it's like to be on a set and to be dealing with marks and cameras and crossing axes and, and all of this sort of like technical stuff that you kind of only learn when you're on set. I feel like that's something that I've really been able to hone because of them and just because of the time there. But outside of that, I mean, I think what they both taught me is that you, with, with more going on outside of what's happening on set, right? Like outside of your day job as an actor, with more going on outside of that, you are a more interesting performer. And so you know, Jane, there are politicians coming to set to visit her and founders of nonprofits coming to visit her and she has fire drill Fridays and she's a huge environmentalist and Lily's doing um, nonprofit work for um, comedy and theater all the time in the arts. Um, she does a lot of work in Michigan and um, for, for labor and employment. And so like to see these sort of rich full lives outside of work, they become more interesting on camera. And I think that's been a great lesson too. Like you should I mean not you can do it all or try to do it all but the the sort of more you do outside of the job the more you bring to the job totally speaking of I mean you have so many causes that are near and dear to your heart I feel like there's always something you're promoting or someone you're supporting or 
you know, it's the environment, it's the special Olympics, it's Andy's yeah. foundation. I mean, yeah. has that been, is, is that another thing that's been second nature, like to you, for you to have these outlets where you're really giving back? You, you're you such a generous soul and generous spirit. During this quarantine, you're giving away gift certificates, you're finding ways to sp- support small businesses, you're there's just seems like that's such a big component of who you are, this giving back piece. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny, I, you know, I, so my whole family, they're all like my mom, she's retired now, but she was a critical care nurse. My dad was a respiratory therapist. My brother's a firefighter. Like I come from a long line of firefighters. And so I think my family has always been service oriented, even if it hasn't been nonprofit, like even if I wasn't aware of what that world was, they've always been service oriented. My aunt's a special Olympics athlete. So I grew up around the organization seeing how important it was for so many reasons. Um, but I think when you're sort of exposed to that nature, it, it, it like permeates, right? Like it's, it becomes a part of you. And so, yeah, I mean, I think with great success comes great responsibility and that includes giving back and trying to promote. And it's funny, I didn't, as far as like promoting small businesses and being supportive. I don't think I, I don't think I actually had that relationship with social or, you know, I didn't spend my time that way. And then all of a sudden I had Finery, which is a company that I started with a friend of mine where since we've, we've sold it, we're not a part of it anymore. But when we had that, I realized what having a small business was like and what asking those favors was like and how hard that was. And ever since then, if someone comes to me and is like, Hey, I have this new brand or I have this new store or I have this thing I'm trying to build or whatever it is, I try to do everything I can to help because it takes so many people doing so many favors for businesses to be successful. And so Mm -hmm. now I, I feel like I've made a real effort to be more supportive in that way. Whereas I think before I went through that process, I had no idea how challenging that was for people. Yes. So humbling. I want to talk a little bit about parenting because I think that that's like such a valuable thing to talk to other moms about their experience, especially finding a way to balance work and parenting, because it seems to me like it's, it doesn't really actually become a balance. It's more like taking, like, you're going to take a moment for this thing and then you're going to come back and be a parent, you know, like, but I don't know. For me, I've been um, very like, I'm just starting now to get back into the podcast and I haven't gone to do any producing or directing work outside of here. So I've been lucky in that I haven't been ready yet, but I know I'm starting to get like kind of like that itch, that creative, like I need to express myself and find that balance. Yeah. So I think I'm very curious to see what your experience has been in finding the way to be the mom that you want to be and also explore your creative. I mean, as you said, you're an entrepreneur, you had this incredible company, Finery. Um, You're an actor, you do all this service. I feel like there's so many different like elements of your life. How do you make time for it all and, and feel like you're doing a good job? Uh, So I, uh, that's a good question. And I think I'm still trying to find the answer to it. I wholeheartedly believe in giving credit to the people who help us. We have a full-time nanny. She's wonderful. It's because of her that I can do so much. And I know that a lot of people are not in that position where they can have a full-time nanny. But the reason I want to say that is because I think oftentimes people are asked this question, how do they balance it all? Especially when they have so much going on and to not give that credit is doing everyone who's listening a disservice because it's making Mm -hmm. them think that you can do it all without help, which is totally not accurate for me. So we have a full-time nanny. And I also have a husband who doesn't have a full-time job anymore. So he can totally make his, I mean, he still works. He's still incredibly busy with the foundation, of course, but he can really sort of make his schedule what he wants. And as a result, when I, so we live in, we split our time between North Carolina and Texas, but I shoot in Los Angeles. And so if I have to go for two to three days, I'll go by myself. My husband makes sure he doesn't have anything going on. He stays home and covers the kids. If I have to go for longer than that, we all go together. I mean, it's, it's a huge juggling act. And I think at the end of the day, you talked about sort of like feeling like you're doing it the way you want or feeling guilty. I think that that guilt never goes away. No matter one of my best friends is a stay at home mom who has three kids. She works her butt off from sunrise to sunset. And she feels guilty because she's not showing her kids that she's at work. I have friends, I have a friend who's a divorce attorney. She works nonstop and she feels guilty because she feels like all she's doing is working. I have the schedule that I do and I feel, you know, like I think that comes with parenting 
And I think mm-hmm. that guilt never goes away. Um, but I am a big believer in, I, I also am kind of old school and I'm like village, a village should raise children. Like you should be raising kids with your friends and with your family if possible. Like that, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, to, to answer a question, I don't have an answer, but I think that um, we can do it all at the same time, but not our, on our own. It's only with a lot of help. And that's kind of, I don't, I hope that answers it, but it's, it's really disjointed and messy and it works. Yeah. Way. No, I think that that's, that's important to recognize that there really isn't this like clear answer. First of all, all of our circumstances are different, so it's going to look different for all of us. But I think it's at the end of the day, perhaps we're each trying to find out where we feel fulfilled and alive and happy and like maybe, you know, that's just going to be different for everybody, but also understanding that guilt is kind of an inherent piece of it because when, you know, I kind of feel like, um, like we only have one kid, we have one kid, he's now just crawling around and moving. So like, I can't imagine what it's like once they start walking or once you have more than one child. But so we have, and when Rory and I are like exhausted, like I'm like, does, does everyone else think parenting is easy? Because I don't think people are talking about this enough. It's exhausting. Yeah. So we're, and I'm like trying, so so say I'm trying to work on a podcast and it's like Rory and I are taking shifts throughout the day and like, I'll be like working on this and he's working on his projects. And, um, I just feel like there has to be a point where you can relinquish what used to be like, Hey, I want this to be really good, but like, maybe it's just going to have to be like at this level, because this is the time I have to do it. And it's better that I do it this way than not do it at all. And so it's not going to look maybe the same as it did before, but that's okay. I mean, it's just the two of us here. So we just have to figure it out. I imagine at some point when you're traveling or leaving your kids, it's like, of course you're like, it's sad when they're like, don't go. I mean, I can't imagine how hard that would be that my heart would be like in a million pieces, but you know, is it better at the end of the day for us to feel fulfilled as humans and showing them, Hey, it's important to chase your dreams. And so there's just so much duality involved. It's like, Yes. And understanding that that's part of it, almost like it's like, okay, ah, yes. you can take the pressure off a little bit. There's not this perfect balancing act that exists. It, it does not. I think the idea that anything's going to look like it did before kids is just not, it's never going to, it's never going to be that way. It's never going to look that way. But I think that's actually interesting. And I think for you guys, for you, especially being so creative, I think that It's not going to look like what you did before. Maybe before you were a total workaholic, you were incredibly meticulous about your work. You had a very clear vision and now it's a bit messier, but there's an argument for your motherhood and your experience and your exhaustion. Actually that messiness bringing a really interesting layer to your work that maybe you didn't have before. And I, and I have to tell myself that like as specifically as a performer, because that's what keeps me away from my kids it's messy. I'm exhausted. All the same things. I can't focus the way I did. Maybe I'm working on my lines the day before versus a week before, like I used to. It's just a different approach. But I tell myself that this sort of new phase of life for me, this messiness brings something more interesting to my performance and my work. And I think maybe that's not the case. We're lucky that we work in creative fields because I do think that that messiness is really interesting. Maybe that's not the case for my attorney friend. Um, but I do think that the shortcomings or the sort of new, I thought I saw a wild animal walking. I didn't, Ooh. we're okay. Um, it's bear season, so I'm, it's a squirrel. We're good. Um, sorry. But I do think that, um, that, that, I just think that messiness cannot a layer of interest that might help your work in a way that even if it isn't an approach that you've used before or that you recognize as being successful, it's special. Yes. How do you and Andy balance kind of being parents and making time for your relationship? I don't think we do it well. I mean, we're not, we don't have, I, I'll say it goes in waves and a lot of it depends on the phase that our kids are in. Um, right now our kids are in a really like knock on wood all of a sudden it's gotten so much easier and we every night we have been watching old 80s movies like famous movies that we've never like fatal attraction we had never seen before either one of us so like we've been doing that at nights together and like drinking a bottle of wine and like we've actually it, it goes in phases but um I would say when we first had had kids we we said like let's do one night a week is date night 
And because of our schedules, what ended up happening is we'd cancel it. And then we'd go a month without having a date night. And then we'd be like, oh my gosh, we went a month without, without having a date. We really like beat ourselves up for it. And I think what we realize is like it ebbs and flows. There are going to be months where your kids require everything of you and your relationship kind of, I don't want to say take us a backseat because it should always come first, but like definitely, you know, gets put on the side a little bit. And then there are times, and those times are long and wonderful and plentiful where you can really like align and spend that time together. In a weird way, quarantine has been wonderful for us for that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it goes, it goes in waves. And I think you just have to know that like the kids are little, you know, you guys have a little tiny baby right now. And that, that, that couple times that you time, it's, it's gonna, you're going to get it back. Okay. How has being a parent changed you? It's changed everything, everything. For one, I was telling you before we started, I was so fearless before having kids. I was like, I wouldn't say a daredevil, but I was open to all experiences to travel, would go by myself anywhere. Like I just was a fearless person. And I had my son and I all of a sudden developed a fear of heights. I've become more aware of the dangers in the world. I've just become mm-hmm. more risk adverse, which I never was. And I don't know if that's AIDS or children, but it was pretty immediate after having my son. That was a big one for my personality because I was so up for anything and that's kind of not the case anymore. Um, but oh most- God, that's so the same with me. It's so funny. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's, you're all of a sudden, bi- like biologically, your body's like, nope, you're not going to yeah. do anything that could uh-uh. endanger, you know, it's interesting. But mostly I think- my capacity for like play and joy has expanded so much. You become a global thinker. You're, you know, someone, someone told me actually Marta who, who created our show said that once you have kids, it's like your heart has been removed from your body and is walking around the earth without you. And it's so true. There's this, like, you're so aware of everyone and everything and every challenge. And I think that can be really intense at times. It can be a lot to carry but it also makes you so empathetic and Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's changed everything. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. It changes. I've absolutely changes everything. And the fear thing. It's so funny. Like I've never, I I won't watch like violent things too often because I always, I'm just like this sensitive person and I feel like I like take it with me. And Mm -hmm. that's like Rory's favorite thing to watch. So (laughs) it's so funny. Cause like all like every once in a while I'll be like, Hey, let's watch one of your action movies. Here we go. But since like, I've been extra like protective over my violence, like meter since Jax has come. And I am used to be, I mean, I've gone skydiving I've been like would like go cliff jumping it was like no fear you know and I'm like the polar opposite now I'm like no horror films no it's It's so so different it's It's so and it's in you you can't change that like you can't say I'm gonna buck up and be brave it's like no no it's your something has changed like some chemistry is different and you're just I don't know yeah you become a different person what's the thing that surprised you most since having a baby I think just how I don't know. I would say that it's just the feeling of like how much you are capable of loving something. It's like, wow. Oh my gosh. This little, like, it's like, I don't even think about myself. It's like all of my energy has just like shifted. Like, and before, before having a child, we have this lens that's just like focused inward so often, like so much of our time is like, what do I need? And that's fine. That's, you know, a a great phase of life. And then it's like, all of a sudden, it's like everything is going towards like, what is best for him and what does he need? And he's just, it's like such a, my heart has just opened up like a million times over. It's, 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 yeah, it's explosive. It's a, yeah. And it's immediate. It's so strange. And it's hard and it's hard. It is freaking hard. Like that's another surprise is that, is that it's not easy. And we, he hasn't been an incredible sleeper. So like, there's been a lot of sleepless nights and I yeah. love sleep. Yeah. I am a major sleeper. So, you know, learning to operate without sleep has been tricky. Um, but then again, like somehow we get up every day and are like, yeah. we're here and we have yeah. this like amazing, beautiful being Perfect. that's just Little like, angel. yeah, so present. So yes unbelievably joyful and it's like like you said that playful spirit 
like playing with him and getting, I can't imagine as they get older, like the idea of like make believe and imagination, uh, like that is so cool to access. Cause I'm already just starting to do that with him. Cause he's getting old enough to kind of interact in that way. But like yeah. having like the little bears talking to each other and like seeing how he looks at something and like, like just the shadow on it, like the light, how the light hits it. He's like, wow. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm missing so much. Like how much yes. we miss. They see everything and yeah. you can see that through them. It's such a, it's such a gift. It's such, such a, it's a so much fun and it gets better and better and harder and different and better yes. and better and better. It just gets, and everyone told me that and they still tell me that and we're still new in it, you know, relatively new in it, but it just, every phase you're like, I keep, I said to Andy the other day, I was like, I don't, I want to freeze this and I want to freeze them. I don't want them to grow a day older. And, but it get, it just gets better. It, it's, 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 it's such a gift. It really is. Oh my God. I read something in an article about you that I thought was so amazing and hysterical. You, I guess one of the kids had drawn on the Island in maybe your kitchen. Yeah. Like, and you just decided to turn it into like a canvas for them to yeah. <laughs> come. Can you please, yeah. this is amazing to me. Can you just elaborate on that? <sighs> sure. So <laughs> it was not intentional. So basically, okay, we did this big renovation and we moved in last June. So almost a year ago. And our whole kitchen is white. Like, I don't know what I was thinking, but like white island, white walls, white everything is white. And my daughter, who's two, took an orange crayon, which is like my least favorite color, takes an orange crayon. And, and for whatever reason, so Andy was out of town. I had the kids and I was, I was making their dinner and I was cutting up strawberries and she was so little that I couldn't see her head over the island, but her little fingers kept creeping up over the top of the island and grabbing me strawberries. Like it looked like, you know, the little hand in Adam's family, like her little <laughs> hand was grabbing. So I was so distracted by making dinner and like how cute that was. And because she was right there, I didn't even think that she was up to anything. And the funny thing is I actually filmed her little hand getting strawberries because it was so cute to send to Andy and whatever. Now looking back, I watched the video and very clearly she's holding an orange crayon with the other hand. Like she's getting strawberries with my holding orange. And I come, I've made dinner. I like pull my son in to, to feed them. And there is orange crayon all over the island. Like on every drawer on our white, like white matte paint island oh everywhere. Oh my gosh. And I thought about repainting it and honestly I might still, but for now I kind of was like, they're going to do it again. I mean, <laughs> as much as I say, no, they're going to do it again. And if it's not crayon, they're going to take a chocolate cake hand and wipe it across the island, or they're going to take Play-Doh and throw it up against the door, <laughs> which they have done. And so I'm kind of like, it's their canvas. Like whatever they do to it is fine. And it's disgusting. But I also sort of feel like when they're 18 and they leave home, I'm going to look at that island and like weep because it's going to be all these like sweet totally. memories from when they were babies. And so now it's like a graffiti island. It's so gross. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, am I going to really fight this every day? You know, am I going to oh fight this? Gosh. There's so many other things I fight. I'm like, you know, let them have the island. It's fine. They can color on it. It's <laughs> oh, fine. It's so good. It's so they good. They won. Yeah, they won that one. Yeah. I just love that. It's like kind of nurturing their creative spirit and just kind of forfeiting these adult expectations that we have I feel like the other day I was like like Jax was all energetic and Rory said something like to like kind of like calm him down and I was like no it was like we're not bringing him down to our level <laughs> I was like we need to like figure yes. out a way to like meet him I mean Rory's like the most incredible father ever of course it's so wonderful to watch him with but it's it's so I think like they're the teachers really like they're more present and like more joyful yes. and it's like how can we like access yes. that like they're here to teach us and remind us not being like we have the answers because we just need I to return back there. heartedly believe that yes I wholeheartedly believe that I read something interesting I can't I don't remember who said it or where I read it but it was something along the lines of like where we mess up as parents is trying to make our kids more like us. Yeah. And it really stuck with me because now don't get me wrong. Like many of our friends have said we're the strictest parents that they know. So we definitely are like, we believe in boundaries, like very clear boundaries, but I'm also like within those boundaries, you're a kid and I want to learn from you. And they're so the way they re it's so unadulterated and mm -hmm. beautiful and not in a way that's even childlike like they're so wise and astute and I think because they don't they haven't learned all the like conditions that we've learned their instinct is so in tune and sharp and so I, I like I just I loved that idea of not trying to turn them into little mini me's and instead trying to like 
give them boundaries, like create that little safe place for them, but also just allow them to do whatever it is that they're yeah. inclined to do in that moment. And that's hard. That, that's hard as an adult to give up yes. that control. But it's really fun when you allow yourself to do that, I think. So cool. So fun. Switching gears a little bit. Do you believe that we all kind of have a purpose? And do you feel like that is like acting? Is that for you? Oh, God, that's such a hard question. Um, do I believe we have a purpose? I, I, you know, I do believe that we all have a purpose. But I think there's so much emphasis put on success and drive and passion, not passion, but success and drive. And I've been like a workaholic my entire adult life and incredibly driven. Um, obviously like I try to do a million things at once, but I've kind of started to realize like that maybe success is simply in like cooking a great meal for your family and like growing a vegetable garden and going for a walk in the woods. And like, for whatever reason, this quarantine has like really connected me to nature. Yeah. My mom's, my mom, this, my mom's like a total hippie. And so she's going to, I don't want to give her too much credit. And I don't want her to hear this because she'll be like, finally, I've been telling you this. But um, I, I think that we put so much emphasis on success. And I think maybe we're losing sight of what success means. Yeah. And as far as my passion is concerned, it's really hard to answer that because acting, for example, if I were to do something or be on a project that I loved and I didn't make a penny, I would be thrilled doing it. Like, I don't need to be paid to do that job, which to me says it's a passion, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's something you love. But at the same time, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, I'm like, I'm coming to terms with that question, that answer myself. I, I, I don't know if we're all supposed to do one thing. I, I love to hear stories about people who like worked their entire life for one thing and they achieved greatness. Mm -hmm. I've been someone who's jumped all over the map that I don't know. What do you think? I think it's been a question that I've been asking for a really long time. And I think the reason I always ask people is because I don't know. And I don't know that I think it always, my answer always evolves, but I believe that, I believe that we're all trying to evolve in this lifetime and there are different things that we do to help our evolution and to help us become more conscious. And I think what you really hit the nail on the head with is the idea that like, having these goals and thinking that we're going to have happiness when we achieve them. I, I, that's been the most common theme of people I've interviewed where they say, I thought like if I achieve these things or if I made more money or if I did this one thing that I would become happy and then it's, it's a myth, you know? So yeah. it's finding that joy and happiness in presence and being where we are and, and in love and in connection and these things that are, um, kind of these energetic things that we can access right now, no matter where we are, no matter what circumstances we have. And I think we all have different expressions of, of that. And like my gifts might be different than yours and yeah. Rory's and Andy's. They ha we all have different ways that we're going to kind of bring that love and presence into the world, but that we're, kind of on individual journeys to access like what's going to bring that into our life so that we can share it with the world. To me, that's like the most important thing is figuring out how I can be of service, like how I can be used by like the universe or whoever mm -hmm. is of this greater sources, because I think that is where we, A, I will find the most joy and fulfillment and happiness and be able to serve the people I love and the world in a better way. No, that's right. It does. And I think I agree with everything you said. My brother, for example, my brother's a firefighter. He's, he's creative, very creative actually, but he's not like, he's so content and going to work, doing his duty and his job and coming home and living his life. Like that to him is like success. Mm -hmm. And I think that had been success for so many people for so long, like this sense of duty where like, I'm going to my job, I'm providing for my family, I'm coming home and I'm enjoying the fruits of my labor. And I think now work has gotten so creative for so many people. So many people are entrepreneurs now and so many people have multiple jobs and you know, you have this gig economy. And I think as a result, are we 
becoming obsessed with work giving us the fulfillment or mm-hmm. is that actually freeing us up to like find the things that make us happy? And I don't have the answer. I, I don't know. But I think um, I've been asking those questions a lot lately too. I mean, you have for as long as I've known you, but I've been asking those questions of myself a lot lately simply because with my industry, one, I don't know what the future holds with this. And two, I'm a woman in film and television. And like for most women, there's an expiration date. And so it's like, mm-hmm what happens next? What happens Mm -hmm. after? Especially as we're sort of like coming to the end of this season, our final season on the show, it's like, this has been my life for the last six years, which is so unusual in this business. Like what's next? And I have no, I have no answers for you. I have no idea. It's filled with, I don't want to say anxiety, but like there's a lot of tension around this thought and I, and I don't have any answers. When we're asking those questions, I just feel like we're heading in the right direction always, because that's the first step as I think having that curiosity of of what like truly is bringing satisfaction to our lives because it's so often, I mean, I can, I've just, I still feel like I'm searching. I mean, I think I'm going to be always seeking. And sometimes I feel like that's to my detriment because I'm like, God, it just would be easier to just like be able to chill out for a second. Totally agree. Yes. You know, it's like, how can we find that balance of like, I want to seek, but I really want to also be where I am and rooted and grounded in this moment and feel satisfaction and abundance in what I already have yep. while also like growing and learning. And um, it's, I, yeah, I don't know the answer, but I do know that, that I think that the satisfaction and the fulfillment that we're all seeking is so much closer than we think and is right yeah. here right now. And I love that idea. But having, like you said, like you have do so many different things and you have so many different expressions of yourself and having one be like, oh, I'm not sure how, where acting is going to go. This, there's this uncertainty of where that might unfold and how that can be scary because there's a lot of unknown. And also like, yeah, like what's your, what's your expression going to be then? If, if yeah. that stops, where will your outlet be? Because I do think I do think it's okay to like be looking for, for fulfillment in our professional career and like having yes, that, but you're right. also not too much, you know, it's like finding the balance of like knowing that you have these creative outlets, but also when we lose the balance where it becomes like all, you know, people who, but I don't know, actually I take that back because maybe certain people are meant to like have more of an expression in their professional career yes. and then they don't have like as much of a family life like is is that okay if they're happy yeah. are they really happy like I don't I don't who I don't am know. I to say I know for me my balance is definitely gonna going to always come back to like having a balance with family and career and finding those a marriage between those two that feels like success but yes. nothing's more successful than a successful present moment is what I think Eckhart Tolle says I think that's right. That's exactly right. Yes, that's exactly right. And I think where it gets complicated, but it's almost like an embarrassment of riches is when you do find so much joy in what you're doing professionally and also your home life. And those things, for me, for example, there's, they don't always, they kind of can butt up against each other simply mm-hmm. because of the geography of filming a show is typically sure. in Los Angeles. And we don't want to live in Los Angeles. Our families are on the East Coast and the South. And so it's like, to, it'd be so much easier to walk away from something that presented sort of like logistical challenges to your life if it didn't bring so much joy. It's it's really, really tough. And I don't want to say it's tougher for women because I I do think, I can't imagine, I always say like the, the cultural expectation for males to provide, I can't imagine living with that constant burden, right? Like for that so mm-hmm. many men specifically have dealt with for generations. But I do think for women, like biologically, and this isn't for all women, but I do think like biologically and scientifically, there is more of a biological pull to like nurture, to nurture period, and also nurture a family, you know, and again, this isn't exclusive, of course, but like there is a biological pull. And so it's how do you, it's, it's hard. It's hard for my friends who choose not to go to work, who are working at home. And it's hard for my friends who have full-time jobs and it's hard like it's just it's a balance that I think everyone is trying to nail and Mm -hmm. and I I I don't know that I know anyone who would say I know people who seem like they have it figured out I don't know anyone who would say that they have it perfectly figured out Mm, I know I I love all I know is I love talking about it because it's 
it's just something to be curious about, right? Like, well, I do think that we, we, I always feel like I have a luxury. Like when I have the luxury to think about these things, like I recognize that that's a luxury also, yes. <laughs> you know? Like how privileged are the we that we get to talk about what we're passionate about and like we get to decide what to do versus like, I have to work because I need to survive and I need my family to work. It, to talk about goals and to talk about goals is a privilege, truly, totally. truly. Totally. So yes, thank you for, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. That's true. Yeah. So what else? Is there a message that you feel like is important for people to hear right now? Just a, you know, Ooh. minor question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we haven't seen the end of this thing. We don't know how long, for how long we're going to be in it. I, I think personally, I think forgiveness of oneself is the most important thing that we can mm. allow for ourselves and each other right now. Because, you know, I've been telling friends, like, I'm part of me is dreading coming out of this because I dread the question, well, what did you do during, during quarantine? Because it's almost like the question for an actor, well, what are you working on next? It's so mm. terrifying. You know, it's like, I did nothing. I didn't, I don't know what I did. I did nothing for two months. I have no idea. I was not productive or I was productive or whatever that looks like. You did I, the school year soul podcast, Brooklyn. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yes, I did. But do you know what I mean? There's that, like, totally. there's fear about, like, what have I done for the last two months? And is it bad that I haven't really done anything? Point is, is that um, I think right now, the biggest thing is just forgiving ourselves for drinking too much, not drinking at all, being hyperproductive, not being productive, like whatever that thing is, this is not something that humans that we are, were equipped to handle. This isn't something that we were prepared for, educated for, like this is something, a situation we were all kind of like thrust into. And so mm -hmm. whatever that experience looks like for you, that's, that's it, you know? And I, I, that's, that's a terrible answer, but truth is, no. is I just think we need to like allow ourselves to, because there are days when I have made myself a margarita at 12. Like fully making my kids lunch and like squeezing the limes and the tequila, yeah. you know? Hey. And then there are other days where like, we're painting faces and building forts and having the most magical days ever. And then there are days where I'm like, will I ever work again? Is this the end of our industry? You know, it's just, it's been all over them. It's been all over the map. For all of us. I totally hear you. It's, it's a roller coaster. Such is life, right? That's right. That's right. When you were saying this like fear of not doing enough, I've been listening to this thing with Eckhart Tolle and he talks about balancing doing versus being and how we're in a culture that's so driven by doing and it's kind of what you were saying earlier but like gosh maybe that's this reminder for us right now is like how important it is to learn remember to be versus having these things that we're like doing and checking off the list and like expressing ourselves that way like if you're sitting with your child and you're present and you're fully there like that is 100% I know the greatest gift you can give to your kid right is that yep. beingness Yep. And the building the forts and the painting the faces and all like that is the greatest gift. And maybe in cult in our culture, it's like we should take more time to celebrate being because the doing is already we're overwhelmingly celebrating that. But how often are we celebrating right. just like being in the present? I think that's yeah. spot on. I think I think that's spot on. I think I think people talk about being present and, but in a way where that's also a, a box to check, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like people talk about being present in a way, in our culture, to your point, yes. in a way where, for example, I, <laughs> this is too much information and I know we're closing things up, but I was seeing my gynecologist right after I gave birth to my second or shortly after. And, um, and my gynecologist was like, okay, so what are you doing for self-care? Are you doing yoga? Are you doing meditation? What are you doing? And I said, nothing. And my gynecologist was like, well, you should probably start. And I remember saying in that moment, like, no, don't, don't put that on me because that to me is another thing. It's like check. another box to check, you know? And so, but, but I think that's the point. I think you're right. I think, I think what you're saying is right. And I think the way our culture has interpreted being present is, a box to check. And I think you're, I think to simplify it and to get back to the basics of what that actually means is probably what we all need to be tapping into a little bit more. Yeah. Gosh, I could feel yeah. like I could go on like a hundred tangents with you. I love I talking to you so much. I'm <laughs> like, too. I have to really hold back because there's like 10 things I want to like follow that up with. Oh my uh, I love talking with you. 
Thank you so much for being with me today. I loved every minute of chatting with you. You're such a light. Thank you. I can't wait to hang out with you. I can't wait to see you. When all of this is over, we're getting these babies together and we're going to have the biggest non quarantine, non, what is it? Social distance hugs possible. So thank you for having me and for asking great questions. Oh my God. I can't wait. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really, really appreciate it.